of the scariest things that facilitators saw in here, things like the absence of pressure. Uh, we, we saw in the video a lot of, why aren't you doing it? You're, you're not walking. Our goal of choice, strategy, choice, track development, and promotion of practices. But things that undermine who we're talking are pressure towards outcomes, punishment, contingency, goal imposition, deadlines, controlling rewards, ego involvement, and surveillance. With competence, this is the feeling that one has sufficient ability or expertise relevant to an experience. It's like self-efficacy. Um, and um, we, you know, we get a lot of experience with this one in good, in good games. We feel competent in the game, like we can handle this. And that's part of what makes it so engaging. Uh, again, from Richard Vines' work, things that facilitate that are optimal challenge, positive feedback, and informational rewards. Whereas undermines is not optimal challenge, it's a negative feedback. For relatedness, I mean, first three are the ones that pertain to self-determination theory. Belongingness and connectedness with others, good relationships, a secure relational base, and some of that definition is also drawn from Perma and Salazar's work. Um, so, relatedness can be supported by empathy, warmth, and acknowledgement of emotion. Uh, things that undermine it are cold interaction, lack of positive involvement. And we actually have an example later of some research that uh, now because of some recent research by Facebook, we can add possibly, I should say, directed communication uh, supports relatedness according to that research, and we'll look at that paper a little bit more later. So uh, I directly say something to you, for example, on Facebook, versus just consumption of uh, broadcast content that isn't directed at anybody in particular. We all also have added compassion, because uh, that's a particular factor I'm very interested in, and it's the feeling that arises That differentiates compassion from empathy is that motivation to do something about it, uh, whereas empathy is looking specifically just at feeling the same as somebody else or understanding what they're feeling. So it is a motivation as, and it leads to potentially altruism. So we have a paper that looks at least speculates based on the research in um, neuroscience and psychology on how you might facilitate compassion, addressing the places of deservedness because when people feel people don't uh, people deserve their lot. They're less likely to feel compassion towards them. Uh, supporting feelings of agency. So you can get lost in empathic distress when you feel disempowered. If you feel like you can do something, uh, you're more likely to feel compassionate and then take action. Provide opportunities for the practice of altruism. And again, this links back to the superhero study. Uh, and I think probably one of the reasons people uh, helped afterwards in the real world is because they felt empowered to do so. I can do something here. So I will uh, provide opportunities for elevation and supporting compassion training practices. Finally, L and O, we have meaning. Find a deep sense of fulfillment by employing our unique strengths for a purpose greater than ourselves. And like the example with the event payroll, when we have something that's a boring task, we should look at how can we tap into the intrinsic motivation that has meaning, because we're not tapping into that right now, and it's just looking very practical and dull. So meaning can be quite powerful. And um, finally, engagement. Taking part in activities that absorb one completely is one way of looking at that, that's from Perma. And then there's also a lot of talk in our field about flow and states of concentrated attention with loss of self-consciousness and complete uh, absorption. So now we go on to the activity. And you have your card. I'm going to pass out, or we will pass out some scenarios for you to think about, and it's basically just to get some practice, so everybody gets one little stake and packet, some practice in thinking about the scenarios from the perspective of practice as well. So on the first side, you're just going to jot down whatever comes to the top of your head, don't you know, labor this too much, what things might support well-being in this scenario, and on the other side, what things might hinder well-being. And then on the back, you'll just fill out with a little bit more specificity, think about the scenario against each of the specific determinants that you have as cards. Sorry, I'll start packing that out. Um, people will get different scenarios. So your pictures might not look exactly like the one that the person sitting next to you have.
and then just hold on to your sheets for now. We'll use this one later. So after this activity, we're going to now cover a bit more before the coffee break. Hopefully coffee will help us warm up a little bit. Uh, what we want to do now is look at frameworks, tools, more in detail, the type of things that you're using here. We have obviously the cards, uh, but there are other more, if you want, theoretical frameworks that we can use. Uh, we, I would like to cover those in more detail. So in this slide, uh, you're not meant to read this carefully, you'll have it all in the book explaining more detail. But we have classified these determinant factors in three groups. The first one would be the, the self or intrapersonal. These are factors that don't require kind of a social feature. It's about you as an individual. Things like positive emotions, motivation and engagement, self-awareness, mindfulness, resilience, things that are generally an individual aspect. Okay? They don't have to come with the social side. So instead, the social feature or interpersonal, things like gratitude and empathy, are things that happen when we interact with another person, particularly with people we know, but it could be uh, people in general. And what we call transcendent or extrapersonal, things like compassion and altruism, are things that are factors that we engage with um, with people in general, or creatures in, in general. Compassion and altruism don't depend on us seeing the other person. We might care about certain causes even if we don't know them. And there's literature from psychology for each of these factors. Uh, hedonic psychology, that is uh, Daniel Kahneman that I mentioned before, that Nobel Prize winner, his work has been mostly on hedonic psychology. Subjective of Dean by Ed Diener, uh, Gildan and Brodini, and so on. So for each of these, we have a bunch of literature that shows a relationship to well-being. Then we have strategies that psychologists have developed and tested on how those factors can be promoted. For example, for positive emotions, savoring, or positive ruminating, reframing, are all things that help with uh, developing positive emotions. And the, the last columns are methods and measures, so instruments that psychologists have developed and tested to make sure that, that if we design for that, there is a positive impact. For positive emotions, we can use the TANA scale, that we're going to talk about later, or general well-being measures, subjective well-being measures. It's a number of instruments that we have readily available to use for these things. For example, the PANAS is quite common. It's a, self, a small questionnaire about positive and negative effects, emotions. So generally, the experiments there is you have a stimulus, and you measure before and after how your emotions change. You feel more positive or more negative. It could be a set of photographs, and then we see that people uh, the photograph has a, a negative e effect on people's emotions, so it could be the opposite. Or mental well-being scales, like Tennant, 2007, satisfaction with life scale, that is uh, very commonly used, subjective well-being. Uh, some of these scales can be used worldwide, so there are statistics uh, done across different countries to see how, for example, a certain economic system can promote well-being in different ways. So the World Happiness Report is one of them. In the US, rather than having census level data, there's a Health Wage Well-being Index, that is a daily 
report on well-being based on a cohort study uh, of daily assessment of well-being. And there is research on how factors like basic needs satisfaction, those are the ones that we mentioned before, autonomy, competence, relatedness, how those are applicable for different cultures. So in this study, they show how uh, subjective well-being is correlated to need satisfaction in different cultures, in the US, Russia, Korea, Turkey. And as you can see, the correlation is pretty high uh, across the world. So that means that when we integrate, or we use these determinant factors in our designs, hopefully they will apply in different places. The other thing we find useful is to look at the spheres of influence that these factors are, can have. So the first one is technology environment. These are the tools, uh, it's contextualized to the tools we're building. Then the activity and personal development. So technology, a software environment can support the sense of autonomy, for example, or competence, uh, when the user feels in control. So when we build features that, um, that allow us to change a mobile app, the background color, upload photos, all those things that allow us to do a little bit more in the context of that application, this is all about the technology environment. It's not going to improve necessarily outside, but in that particular context, we feel more autonomy. We feel more in control of the tool. And that's often what we have in, to account when we do user experience. And then we have the activities. So a technology can support the sense of autonomy or competence in other things, in, in the things that we're doing that is not necessarily in the same context of the technology. A wheelchair allows a disabled person to do things that otherwise he couldn't. So it adds to the autonomy. That's not necessarily a digital technology, uh, but it has to do with an activity that is mobility. Uh, we can talk about Strava, or one of those apps for uh, engaging with exercise, with cycling or running, and the app is engaging you with an activity, and the purpose is that for you to go outside the technology, no, it's really the activity what matters, not so much using the app itself. And finally, personal development, and we're going to give you some examples where the technology is trying to help you build uh, autonomy of competence or any of these factors as a life skill. So it's outside even the specific activity. Long term for me this is the most interesting is uh, especially for those of you who are academics it's like a educational purpose almost. It's helping the person develop skills. It's like good parenting even. Good parenting is helping your kids develop the autonomy, the self-efficacy that they will be able to use in real life. Can we do that with technology? That uh, would be the interesting thing. So let's look first at the context of games. We all know how important games are as a technology, as a business. Or, uh, and one thing that they have that is particularly interesting is that the activity, like a game, and the technology environment are the same thing. They come together, right? Because the activity is using the, the, the game, playing the game. In this particular study by Ryan and Rippey, they use uh, paint, um, that is the plain, uh, something needs satisfaction. And they look at three scales there, the competence, that is five set of questions. Things like, I felt competent and effective. The case kept me on my toes, that did, but did not overwhelm me. So I was in the right level of difficulty. Player experience of need satisfaction. Thank you. <laughs> Player experience of need satisfaction. Autonomy, so I, another small instrument, five questions. I did things in the game because they interested me. Uh, I felt for the opposite, I felt control and pressure to be a certain way. Okay. So the, with these questionnaires, we can see the subjective experience of people regarding need satisfaction. Intuitive controls or presence, that's closer to what we will call in our domain more usability. And then we have measures of well-being, things like subjective vitality, self-esteem, mood rating, game enjoyment, and so on. So what they did is they compare different games, they look at the top 
most popular ranked games and the least uh, popular games out of uh, a ranking that uh, was available at that time. We run this up. So Super Mario 64 was one of them, and they had Zelda, I think, was the one that was doing worse. And these are the results. Future play is most easily explained, highly correlated with competence, autonomy, and relatedness. Ye, this year, uh, these are scales that are being used by the gaming research community. So the correlation with these other factors with self-determination theory works better. The number of hours the players engage per week was also highly correlated with competence and relatedness, uh, not so much with autonomy, but this was um, explained better than most of the other factors. Enjoyment and mood also highly correlated with need satisfaction. I think it's particularly interesting that even future play uh, and engagement, so things that are variables that are beyond well-being, things that every company, gaming company is also interested, was predicted by this need satisfaction. So the conclusions from this study are that the game autonomy and competence are associated with changes, positive changes in well-being. Um, and they also predict things like enjoyment and future play. And for us as designers, we can see that we can support competence and autonomy. In this case, they could do this through features, and they've been doing this for a while. In games, you look at each feature if it adds something, uh, for example, a hook, uh, that allows you to move in the game in a different way. If it gives you extra autonomy or extra sense of competence, that will have a positive impact. Now, activities, when you look at the level of activity, it's interesting to see the motivational factors behind. In this other study, they look at helping uh, by intrinsic motivation. So one of the groups were asked to help, and they were kind of forced to help, so it was non-autonomous, and other people were given the opportunity to help intrinsically by intrinsic motivation and they compared the two groups. The people that helped, because they had a motive for helping, intrinsic motivation, they were much more likely to be positively, feel positive, positive well-being. Vitality was also higher, self-esteem was much higher, and need satisfaction in general. So you see the need satisfaction is correlated to all these other important things. So they are, uh, what we're trying to show you here is uh, a lot of work psychologists have done that tells us about activities, about, in this case, game design, and how they can have a positive impact on, on well-being. So let's look, look at other cases. This one is the one we mentioned before uh, on Facebook, and this is an activity. It's a writing or communicating to others. If it's directed communication, if the, co the activity is one-on-one, -on -one, so I'm sending you a message, or you or a small group, so it's directed, that has an increase in bonding. I, I feel more connected to the people, and I will, that will be supporting my well-being. If instead, it's about broadcasting content, so I just post on my news feed for the whole world to read, or I go and just spend time consuming content that has, uh, it is correlated with loneliness and reduced social capital. So it has a positive, the opposite effect. That's also very informative uh, on how we can design. There are certain social features that will have a positive influence and other ones are not. And we as designers are influencing the, the different type of behaviors. Uh, in this particular uh, study, uh, Moria Burke and uh, the other group of fantastic researchers uh, use bonding scales and the UCLA loneliness scale and uh, something they call their Facebook intensity scale that measures how much time they, they're spending uh, on Facebook. Self-esteem and satisfaction with life complement the, the well-being aspect. So we're going to look uh, a little bit more explicitly now of some methods, um, research methods we can use. I guess the, the first one is 
the set of observational techniques we can use. This is another study by on Facebook, really interesting. And they use a, a statistical technique that allow us to explore um, emotional causation without direct intervening, without experimental design. And this is the fact that weather influences our emotions. If it's a rainy day, we generally don't feel as well than if it's a sunny day. But obviously, we don't, our emotions don't influence the weather. So they use this very simple factor to look at how emotions contain. So if you are in London, but it's a sunny day, and you post things online, that will have a positive impact on uh, your friends in California or elsewhere. Uh, so if one positive post decreases in general 1.8 negative posts. And a negative post decreases 1.20 if it's a positive. So if you're in sunny California, but it's a rainy day, and you write to other people, you are influencing the rest, but luckily not as much as the, the positive news do. Is this clear? Yeah? So this is how emotions contain, how they pass around. We like to think that Australia can explore a lot of sunrise. Contage is a direct translation from the Spanish. We are lacking this verb in English. Oh. Contage. But yeah, that's sorry. okay. I believe we need to add it. No, um, actually, contagion. Contagion yeah, is your. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> that's my mistake. But, yeah, pass from one to the other. Contagion. Uh, you can also do experimental designs where you have a control and a treatment group. But this one is much more challenging. Yet, this is another example, also from Facebook. This one. You probably all read about it. It's a paper by Kramer, Kramer Gilroy, and Hancock. It came up like in 100,000 newspapers all over the world. It was, uh, was a very interesting study, very, very good. Uh, but it shows the challenges of doing experimental design, especially at that scale. So what happens here is that if you go to your Facebook, the Facebook feed has too many posts, and they don't necessarily fit. So you have to filter them out. So what kind of filter do you use? What they consider here is two possible designs. A filter that eliminates positive posts. So they look, if it was a new story from your uncle who won the lottery, that post maybe didn't appear. Okay, it was positivity review. <coughs> they had also a very large sample, 600, almost 700,000 people participated on that study. Negativity reviews is the opposite. You had your cousin had a car accident, and maybe that got filtered. You didn't get to see it. So what was the impact? Well, positivity reduced condition had fewer positive posts by the other people who consumed that content, and more negative posts. And the negativity reviews had fewer negative and more positive. So we can see that the impact of that filter uh, it has an impact on other people, on the emotions of other people. And that is a design problem. We need to know, take into account, how a filter may impact other people's emotions. There are also quasi-experimental designs we could use, post, pre, and post test. Uh, this one, Echo, is by people uh, using Santa Cruz. Uh, a Steve Whitbacker group. Um, basically, it's an app, a mobile app, where you can journal or record uh, personal stories. Um, and they use a number of scales. It has 44 participants, half of which use one where you also had the opportunity to reflect about those uh, personal record stories. They use a well -being, deep well-being scale, the subjective happiness scale, satisfaction with life scale, uh, psych psychological general well-being scale, so a quite, quite comprehensive set of scales, and uh, linguistic analysis to see, to interpret automatically the people's reflections. So there are scales and tools that we can use to analyze the logs that people leave us with the impact of the given design. But I think uh, coffee should be served outside. Hopefully that helps us warm, and then we will come back for another activity. In the meantime, if anybody has questions, please come over.